Technology, the medium between entrepreneurs and cyber criminals. That's what we're going to talk about today. I think for us to understand what this median is, uh, we have to understand what the motives are. What are the motives for an attacker? What are the motives for an entrepreneur? There's actually three basic motives for uh, an attacker. Uh, they are opportunistic in that uh, they're looking to gain financial, uh, they're looking to seek financial gain. And these opportunistic attackers, these guys are out trying to get your credit card information, trying to get your personal information, that type of stuff. And they're putting it out there on the internet and selling it and bartering it and that kind of stuff. And that's, that's, they're just scouring the internet. There's no specific targets. Then the second group of uh, attackers that are out there are target attackers. You can think of these guys as your national states, right? You hear on the news, China and these other countries and the US and NSA and NSA and NSA. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> they, they're seeking confidential, uh, your, your, uh, confidential and proprietary data, right? So that's what they're targeting. Um, and then you also have hacktivists. Hacktivists are people like, you've probably heard of Anonymous. They're hacking for a cause. They have some kind of belief or that somebody has offended them or uh, they maybe have offended about something. Or, there's some kind of cause. They all rally together and then they go hack some stuff for it, right? Well, Entrepreneurs also have motives too, right? Why has somebody become an uh, uh, entrepreneur? Well, usually a vast majority of them are looking to solve a problem. Uh, they think they can see a, a technology or they see an issue with something and they think, hey, I can make this better. Um, so they do that through innovation. And then the second group of entrepreneurs, they're more like activists, and they're solving real, real problems. The best example I can give you of that is think of like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and how they're you know, eradicating malaria, stuff like that. Uh, and then the last little bit of group of entrepreneurs, they have financial gain. Uh, they're looking to you know, better their standard of living. They're looking to profit off of what, what they're doing. That's a smaller subset of people. Um, with all this, they all play on the exact same field in our world that we live in today. And that, that field is in the world of technology. Everything that we do is focused around technology somehow or another. There, we can no longer uh, do anything in life without technology being associated with it, whether it be go to the bank, check your, uh, communicate with one another. Like he said earlier, you have smartphones. All this is there. So technology is the center of all this activity. And for us to understand why technology is so important, let's talk about how technology is built. So entrepreneurs, what they do is they see, like I said, they see some type of technology and they think, hey, I can improve upon this technology and do something with it, solve some problem, make our life better. And we like that. So what do they do? They have an idea, they look at the technology, they see it in a box, and they innovate on it, and they think out of the box, and then new technology is born. Very little technology that you see has just spontaneously combusted, or is it actually an original thought. It's usually a derivative of something else. So now that we know how basically technology is built, let's talk about how technology is hacked. And this is the fun part, right? So what happens is the attacker has this idea. He looks at all the innovations and the new characteristics and feature set that the technology that you've implemented or the entrepreneur or whoever it is. He draws this nice little box around your out-of-the-box thinking, and then he creates his own innovation and thinks outside the box and uses it to satisfy one of his motives. Remember, one of his motives might be financial gain, confidential information, stuff like that. So if you look at this, you've heard in the, in the past probably that cybersecurity is this race against good and evil or bad and good, right? I'm here to tell you that it's not a race at all. A race implies a finish, a finish line. Where somebody's gonna win. Either the good guy's gonna win or the bad guy's gonna win. But if you look at this structure right here, what happens? The bad guy just created a new problem set. Who's gonna come behind the bad guy? The next entrepreneur, the next technologist, right? He's gonna draw a box around that, create a characteristic, solve that problem, and it's gonna go on and on and on. So cybersecurity is not a race. It's more like a game of leapfrog. Do you guys remember leapfrog when you were a kid? There's no point to that. Nobody ever wins, right? You just bound over one another over and over and over and over and over and over, and it's just on and on and on. So it's like leapfrog. There is no winner in this. So if we accept that, we can move on. And that nobody's gonna win. All we gotta do is defend it. So let's talk about defending technology. I like to compare it to castle building because all of us know about castles. We've all been young and dreamed about being princes and kings and all that other stuff, right? So we're familiar with castles. What's a castle? Its main function is fortification. So in the ninth century, they started castle building. what they do? They built big giant walls with giant towers with bells in them so that you could warn when they saw the enemy coming across. Um, they, uh, they, they, they had a big moat in front of it and you pulled a drawbridge. When something was bad gonna happen, what'd you do? We ran inside the castle, bounded everybody up, everybody came together and you know the bad guys couldn't get in. Well, in technology, uh, when it was first designed, if you think back 20, 25 years ago, they didn't think about security at all. So none of this stuff was secure. What was our first strategy? Our first strategy to secure any type of technology was to put things in the way, put fortification around it, install firewalls and intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, put all this technology out there. 
Didn't really work all that great for uh, castles and didn't really work all that great for technology either because, well, you guys read every day. We're still getting hacked. So the next thing they said was in castle building, well, we built our first castles out of wood. Everybody knows what happens when you mix fire and wood, right? Yeah. So the attackers, they used technology to take down more technology. So they said we had to build security in. What they do, they changed their foundation construction from wood to uh, stone. They started building, they got bigger, stronger, larger, um, you know, harder to, harder to break down. Same thing in technology. Uh, technology, we said we're gonna build security in, and they created this, you know, secure development life cycle. They put security from start to beginning. We're gonna think about it the whole time. It's gonna meet these certain standards, all this great stuff. And well, I'm gonna tell you this, that happened many, many moons ago, and we're still having issues, right? So they had another thing in castle building. Right about the 12th century, 13th century, they got this scientific approach when they started thinking, you know, we gotta do defense in layers, or defense in depth. And they started building castles inside of castles inside of castles inside of castles. And it's basically multiple layers of these brick walls. Why'd they do that? Well, because right about that same time, they invented this thing called gunpowder, and gunpowder throws big giant metal balls really fast at at big giant walls that turn these big stones into very small stones and defeat it, right? Walls come crumbling down, you can breach it. Or they use a grappling hook and they craft over it. So castles are still being breached and they use this strategy. Well, technology is the exact same thing. What'd they do? They said, well, we have fortification, we have security built in. Well, we need to put stuff on the host, we need to put stuff on the application, we need to do all this great stuff. And then we're gonna correlate it all together and we're gonna have this anomaly detection stuff and it's gonna just be awesome, we're gonna solve our problems. Uh, well, we're still getting breached, right? This is how we do it. And then now, big talk right now in cybersecurity is active defense. I'll tell you, they also did that in uh, castle building. What did they do? They started building right about the 14th century, right before castles like stopped being built anymore. Uh, they built them in, in these uh, concentric poly, poly, or poly uh, well, I can't even talk about that shape anymore, uh, polygon, right? And that which they created flanking fields of fire and they had these, like, these little choke points where the enemy would come through and they'd pour hot oil on them and that kind of stuff. You know the stuff you see in horrific old movies, right? Um, well, they did the exact same thing, or that's what we're talking about doing right now in, uh, in cybersecurity. We're talking about you know, creating booby traps, um, gathering intelligence. Um, the NSA has kind of proved that they're already doing that. You guys probably know about this, right? So active defense, collecting as much information as you can. And there's also been talks of us even hacking back, right? Can somebody hack them back? So that's our defense strategy. So I'm gonna ask you this. Uh, it didn't really work for protecting people, so does it work for technology? Well, I'm gonna show you this little demo. This is a tool that I use to uh, reach people all the time. I'm a hacker by trade. I own a, a cybersecurity company, so I do. This is me creating a little email. It's really quick. You're gonna have to uh, breeze with me because you know, I only get like 15 minutes up here, so I can't tell you all the integral details, but it's really this point and click. I'm sending an email right now. You see success to a Windows 7 box. This is my victim. This Windows 7 box, as you'll see right here, is fully patched, has firewall up, has antivirus, has everything. Um, his name is Sippy. Uh, he's gonna check his email. He gets my email that I just sent him. He'll open it up. Hey, it's a LinkedIn request. I wanna be his friend. All right, so I click on the little accept, or Sippy clicks accept because he wants to be my friend. He clicks, okay, okay, I'm gonna run this because that's normal. Nothing out of the ordinary is being loaded. You don't see any crazy stuff, and you, uh, viruses get blamed for my computer crashing and all this other stuff. Well, it didn't. Uh, I go back to the attacker box, which you see right here. And what I'm doing is I'm taking a screenshot. So now you know that I can actually see a screen. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and just interact with the screen to show that I'm actually there and have just breached it. Uh, we minimize this. And you know, you're not a real hacker until you leave like this little flag, right? This little note. So I'm gonna write this little note that says, look mom, no hands. Don't you wish tech support was this easy? <laughs> and we're gonna close the windows out and we're gonna jump back over to the windows box and just show you that I was there. Yep, I was there. So all that fortification, security built in, Active defenses just failed. What does it remind you of? Wow, we're historians. We, will, we should not repeat our history, right? Well, it reminds you of this, right? City of Troy, unbreachable, fortification, all that great stuff. What the Trojans do? They loaded themselves up in a horse, sat out front, they pushed them in, let the guys in Troy get drunk, waited until they fast out, got out, and killed everybody. It's kind of what we just did with the email. So now that we know that you can be compromised and all that technology stuff fails, let's talk about the impact. It's very unlikely that you're gonna go out of business, but that's what you hear in the news media. Hey, you get hacked, you go out of business. That's not true. What'll more like happen is you're gonna look like this cat here. You're gonna get beat up, bruised. It's going to actually suck. Flat out, it's gonna suck. Your reputation is gonna be horrible for a little bit of time. What do you gotta do? Well, time heals all wounds. Talk to your customers, talk to your people, put out the information. You see it time and time and over. We're sorry, we messed up, we're going to fix this, and we're gonna move on. 
And I've got an actual proof of this. Why? Because I'm gonna ask you this. We're right here in Huntsville, Alabama, and many of you guys work for these guys. Which defense contractor wasn't hacked this year? If you can name one, you're probably not gonna know. Because I think all of them have. Why? Because if you look at this Washington Post right here, 35 individual systems. Now, I'm not going to list contracted companies and all the other stuff because that's just not fair, and I don't think I got enough room on the slide. But so Washington Post pub, yeah, printed a, a consolidated report of some investigations that Congress had, and these are all the systems that were breached in the last six months. There are so many contracts and subcontracts to this that it touches just about every one of the defense contractors out there. Now I'm going to ask you this. How many of them went out of business? None. Why? Because time heals all wounds. All right, so we know we have a problem. How do we, how, what's our solution? How do we solve this? Well, it's not easy, but I'm gonna tell you it's like anything else that's really, really hard. You educate the masses. Why do you educate the masses? Because security is an everyone issue. I normally talk to a bunch of technical people. I do technical demonstrations. I am a technical person. But it's audiences like you who are passionate about things and think outside the box that it's really gonna solve this problem. And the reason it's gonna solve this problem is because you just need to be aware of it. You need to know things that I just showed you that you may, many of you have probably never even seen in your life. Did you know it was that simple to hack a box? No, probably not. And I bet you wish your tech support could hack a box that quickly so that you get your email the next day or whenever you have a problem, right? I need this printer installed. Well, just send me this little email. I'll get it fixed, right? It's not that. So and you're gonna, and education is the key here. And here's the key about this education is it needs to be non-agenda driven education. If the education, and you're gonna tell me, hey, you know what, there's cybersecurity stuff everywhere. The problem is the sources of this information is coming from people that are also selling you a solution that was on one of those four things that were on the castle building things. They're not gonna tell you the strengths and weaknesses. That is good for a technical person. Why? Because a technical person needs to understand what that product or whatever that is to implement it. But for the general masses, that type of education is not good. And I'm not really seeing a great source of education for the general people out there. I guarantee all of you have clicked that 15 point PowerPoint slide once a year for your annual security training. And I bet you're no more security aware than you were before you took it and you were griping about it before you had to go to lunch, right? Click, 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 click. Yes, 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 yes. There's this guy out there that's gonna hack us, right? So I think you actually have to look at breaking it down into three groups and the education has to be non-agenda driven. And the first group is the dinosaurs. And I actually got this dinosaur thing, not because of age, but because of mentality and an interaction I had with a US representative. Earlier this year, I was sitting in the U.S. representative's office and I was telling him about this, this cool company I have and how passionate I am about security and this is just really awesome and wh wh what is your stance on it? And he says, son, I'm a dinosaur. I don't really care about technology. <laughs> oh, no, sir, please don't say that. I, I have a staff. They do that stuff. I don't do it. It just it confuses me. It causes problems. I don't really care about it. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. The problem with this is that the dinosaur... The dinosaurs, not just because of age, but are usually leaders and decision makers and influencers. They're sitting in positions where they're going to regulate, they're gonna make laws, they're going to provide direction to the general people out uh, on this, and he doesn't care. He's never experienced it himself. He's relying on everybody else. So I'm not really sure that he'll get my vote next time. So, <laughs> so the next group, this is more like us. Um, and, I, and this is that middle group. It's not about age, but it's about technology is cool. We weren't born with technology, but we've adapted it, right? Because technology and a new smartphone is cool to have. It's great. It helps my life. I love it. I'll go and get the newest feature. It's, it's just awesome, right? It's like the newest wristwatch or top hat or that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's a culture thing for us. We, we like our new, like when the Kindle came out, we like that. And then the iPod came out, we like that. And the iPad, you know, we love having a thousand songs in our pocket. It's just great. This group, how you educate them, is you have to educate them specifically on security, but it needs to be sexy and attractive and not drag their current you know, implementation of technology. Why, what do we resist when we get information security training and that kind of stuff? We're like, hey, that just makes it harder. What do you mean I have to have a thousand passwords that are all different? There's no way I'm gonna use password on every one of them. Nobody's gonna guess that my password is password. That's too obvious, right? <laughs> Oh, I know, I, yeah, corporations all the time. Number one, password is password. Try that first. So it's gotta be sexy and it's gotta not slow them down. That's us, and that's how it needs to be trained. But honestly, you fix these two groups, you still solve nothing. You've just band-aided the things. How do we actually solve this problem? You have to educate these guys. These guys are born into technology. 
When I was born, my parents got a diaper bag with some diapers in it. The kids are getting born now. I swear they're issuing them iPads. Because <laughs> I see three-year-olds manipulating iPads and hacking stuff that I could never dream of. And I've been doing hacking for 20 years. My son, 10 years old, gets around my security in my house all the time. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Stop playing the video games. I've bought this. No, he does. And I file bug reports to major vendors because my 10-year-old son can get around this stuff. They are born. It defeats all of us adults. But he's just like, I'm going to play this game. Okay. So these guys, they're born into it. They, it's, it's an extension to their being. It is not something new that they've learned and they've adapted and grown into. When they were born, it's just an extension. It's natural to them. It's unbelievable how quickly they absorb it. Us, we've already passed that age of 18 and our neurons are already firing a certain way, so it was hard for us to learn this technology. And in college, we're trying to figure out how to program stuff. And these kids, they're programming amazing stuff at six years old, seven years old, eight years old. It's just unbelievable what they're doing. And it's just natural for them. That creativity's there, that innovation's there, and it's just, it's gonna explode. When these guys get older, it's gonna be outrageous. The problem with that is we don't facilitate that. How do I know this? Let me ask you, what is the foreign language requirement to graduate from high school? Two credit hours. You have to have two foreign languages. What is the technology requirement for you to graduate high school? Zero. It is an elective. An elective. And then the schools that say that they're really super good at this and high tech about it, they facilitate one of the four major uh, subjects, math, literacy, science, and history over some type of technology. That's not teaching technology. You're fooling yourself. They already know how to use it. They're playing it at home. Teach them what technology is, the pros, the cons, how to innovate, how to think differently, how to do what I showed you earlier where they're bouncing and leapfrogging over the attackers. Understand what technology can bring to them and the wealth of information that's at the end of their fingers and also the issues that is going to arise by them implementing new technologies. So I'm gonna leave you with this. Really, really smart guy named Albert Einstein said this. We cannot solve our problems. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. Thank you. <laughs>